Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high speed fiber gigabit internet. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. After seven months of negotiations, the federal government approves Indiana's plan to expand health care coverage to 350,000 uninsured Hoosiers. Healthy Indiana Plan 2.0 is a victory for the working poor in Indiana. Hard-working Hoosiers who currently don't have access to coverage that they can afford. We explain why Governor Pence is touting HIP 2.0 as a national model for Medicaid reform. A state-funded scholarship program that's helped thousands of students pay for college is struggling to keep up with demand. Education is probably one of the most important things you can give to a kid. Like, just as a society, if you have more educated people, things will get better, but it's so expensive. Will state lawmakers come up with the $90 million needed to keep the program afloat? And we take a look back at the blizzard that shut down the state 36 years ago. These stories and a look at this week's top headlines right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. About 350,000 uninsured Hoosiers will be eligible for health coverage starting Sunday. The federal government has approved Indiana's alternative plan to expanding Medicaid. It's being called the Healthy Indiana Plan, or HIP 2.0. Governor Mike Pence made the announcement Tuesday in front of a crowd of health care officials and political supporters. Today, after seven months of active negotiations with the federal government, I'm pleased to inform you that effective February 1, the Healthy Indiana Plan will be available to more Hoosiers than ever before. The state of Indiana has reached an agreement with the federal government on our Medicaid waiver. The Healthy Indiana Plan 2.0 has been approved. Here's how the plan works. If you earn less than 138% of the federal poverty level or about $33,000 per year for a family of four, you can apply to HIP 2.0. Then after you're accepted to the program, there are three plans you can enroll in. HIP Basic is a default plan for poorer Hoosiers that does not require participants to pay into a health savings account, but comes with fewer benefits and includes co-pays. HIP Plus requires participants to pay into a health savings account, but also comes with vision and dental, and for the most part, does not include co-pays. And HIP Link gives low-income residents an option to receive assistance in purchasing private insurance through their employers. To explain more about who will pay for the health care expansion and what kind of reaction it's receiving, we're joined by State House reporter Brandon Smith, who was at this week's announcement. Hi, Brandon. Hey, Joe. Can you first explain why Indiana was seeking federal approval for HIP 2.0 in the first place? Why not just expand traditional Medicaid? Well, Governor Pence has always said that any health care expansion had to be through what he calls a consumer-driven system. That's one that involves uh, what he calls personal responsibility, having skin in the game when it comes to health care. And that's the real difference between HIP 2.0 and the traditional Medicaid expansion that other states have done through the Affordable Care Act. Here, here's what Pence had to say. Healthy Indiana Plan 2.0 is a victory for the working poor in Indiana. Hard-working Hoosiers who currently don't have access to coverage that they can afford. But also, HIP 2.0 is a victory for Medicaid reform. And I believe it could well become a model for states across the country. So the governor is touting this as something the 19 other states that have chosen not to expand Medicaid could use as an example. But one of the main concerns many, including the governor, has was expanding coverage would cost the state money. Does HIP 2.0 resolve that concern? 
It really does. First of all, the majority of the funding is going to come from the federal government. They're picking up a lot of the bill here. They pay 100% of the cost through the Affordable Care Act in the first two years, and then they'll gradually phase that down to where they're paying 90%. As for state funding, some of it will come from Indiana's cigarette tax, but the bulk of the state contribution will be from a new hospital assessment fee. Essentially, Indiana's hospitals are footing the bill here. But Indiana Hospital Association Vice President Brian Tabor says that's something they're willing to do because ensuring people get covered makes financial sense for them. The last uh, full year of data we have is $3 billion for Indiana hospitals in uncompensated care. So when patients are coming into the hospital without uh, coverage, uh, hospitals are providing that care and it goes unreimbursed and the costs are passed along to uh, all of us with private insurance uh, and just something that the hospitals have had to bear. So the proposal seemed to have a lot of support in the people in the room, but they worked with him on the proposal. How about people outside of that circle? Well, this is getting praise from just about every corner. Republicans and Democrats are obviously happy that more Hoosiers are going to be, so many more Hoosiers are going to be covered by this. And while Democrats have said that Pence should have just expanded traditional Medicaid last year, they see this as a good compromise. Federal Health and Human Services Secretary Sylvia Burwell said she's encouraged by the continued interest of governors in devising systems where they can expand Medicaid. Okay, thank you very much, Brandon, from the Indiana State House. Thank you, Joe. We're going to stick with news out of the governor's office here for just a minute. Pence found himself on the defensive after his administration's plans to create a taxpayer-funded new service erupted into a national controversy. Pence tried to backpedal, saying the just in sight would be a news resource, not a news source, but ultimately he killed the plan yesterday. In a memo to staff, he wrote, rather than developing a new website, the IT department would update the current public calendar website to ensure that the press and the public have unfiltered and convenient access to all press releases and public meeting notices. To explain what the controversy and ultimately the unraveling of the governor's plan, we're joined by Indiana University journalism professor Jerry Lanoska. He's written and spoken extensively on the subject of open government. Jerry, first of all, thank you for being here today. Thank you. This idea of having a, a new state agency, is this something new? I'm a little skeptical about whether it's really new or not. The state has a, uh, an extensive architecture already of um, public information from websites uh, for dozens of state agencies uh, that already release information in the form of press releases, pictures, uh, social media accounts across uh, many domains of the state website. And um, some of the press releases are written very much like news, and in fact, some media outlets pick them up and run them uh, as news, uh, either attributed or not attributed. So um, I don't think it's really all that new. I think um, the issue was uh, coordinating it better, making it a little bit more visible and maybe user-friendly for both the press and the public. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not surprised that it went away. You know, you were speaking about social media. We have Facebook and Twitter, and I don't know what just came out today. But uh, yeah. is that a way, a, an acceptable way for news agencies to get directly to the public, kind of bypassing news outlets? Yeah, I think so. I think, and, and I think that's really ultimately the root of the controversy here. Um, we are in the era of um, user-generated uh, content and so the users can be traditional journalists, they can be government officials, they can be businesses. Um, that's not new incidentally. Uh, FDR was doing fireside chats um, many decades ago. So this is that same principle which is to sort of leapfrog has been one of the terms I've heard or bypass traditional media to speak directly to audience. That's no First Amendment crisis, that's perfectly within the, within the rights of government to do that. But I think there is a little bit of boundary control by professional journalists who want to be that filter, uh, understandably, in some respects. So then where is that line, though, between political messaging and traditional media? Well, I think the governor's office is a political office, and so the politics of it didn't really bother me. I was a little bemused by the reaction. The, there, there's political content that comes out of state agencies by the fact that the state is a political entity. We have a governor who uh, is currently a Republican, um, the policies that he puts into place are going to be reflective of Republican politics. And so I don't really have a problem with that. I think where we want the line to be is between policymakers and uh, press and media. And so really that's incumbent on the other side. It's not incumbent necessarily on the 
government to make sure that media coverage is fair and discloses where information comes from. It's up to the media to make sure that readers, viewers, audience members know um, what is the genesis of information. Now, the governor backpedaled, they took away the just insight, but has there been any damage done from this? Um, I think he suffers a little bit of damage. That, that's not really my, my area of expertise, but I, I think that uh, officially the site is going away, but unofficially that infrastructure still will be there and information will still be uh, put out in that same context on an improved website. So I'm not really sure how much backpedaling really sure. is going on. Thank you very much for being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you. And now for headlines, we go over to Alex Dirkman, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thank you, Joe. Amtrak will continue to operate the Hoosier State train line between Indianapolis and Chicago through at least April 1st. The deal announced today ends a contract from the Indiana Department of Transportation that was originally set to expire tomorrow. The department is negotiating renewal of the service on behalf of the state and several cities along the line. INDOT began seeking more cost-efficient contracts to operate the line after congressional funding ran out in 2013. Senators Joe Donnelly and Dan Coates say their support of the Keystone XL pipeline is about jobs. The pair was among the majority of senators who voted yesterday to approve construction of the last segment of the pipeline, which will in its entirety stretch from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico. In a statement, Democratic Senator Joe Donnelly said the Keystone XL pipeline should be a part of a larger comprehensive strategy to invest in infrastructure and energy interests. And Republican Senator Dan Coates says the decision to move forward on the project now lies with President Obama, who has promised to veto the measure. The pipeline has been at the center of a heated debate for years. Supporters argue it will lead to economic growth, while opponents say it is a threat to the environment. Legislators are considering stricter regulations for e-liquids, which are used in vaping pens and e-cigarettes. The production of e-liquids, also known as vaping liquids or e-juices, is essentially unregulated in Indiana. Senator Carlin Yoder, Yoder's bill would create several regulations, including bottling and packaging standards, using childproof caps on containers, and prohibiting the sale of e-liquids to minors. Vape shop owners and manufacturers say they fear the bill is so stringent it will drive them out of business. Now that a 60-day waiting period has passed, the Indiana Department of Homeland Security could take action on an earlier threat to halt construction on Kokomo's baseball stadium over concerns it's not in compliance with FEMA flood regulations. Instead, the state has become embroiled in a lawsuit with the city of Kokomo. As Joe Wren reports, Mayor Greg Goodnight calls the state's actions big government overreach at its worst. Construction workers are still busy on Kokomo's municipal stadium despite efforts to shut it down. Mayor Greg Goodnight announced a lawsuit earlier this week against the Indiana Department of Homeland Security, who argues the project violates the terms of federal hazard flood mitigation grants. We've met the terms and conditions of the, of the grant, and, um, and we've met all the obligations on permitting. In a letter to the Indiana Department of Homeland Security, FEMA officials said the city plans to construct structures in mandated open space areas. State leaders worry the violations could cost the state millions of dollars in federal grants. Our state has sued the federal government over um, you know, the Affordable Care Act, EPA regulations, and now we we're, we're feel like it's kind of being uh, pushed our way as well. The State Department of Homeland Security is consulting with the Attorney General's office to review its options on the pending litigation. A move to make the state superintendent an elected position is making its way through the legislature. The House Education Committee voted yesterday in favor of a bill that would change who serves as leader of the State Board of Education. The bill would allow the State Board of Education to elect its own chairperson rather than having the state superintendent automatically hold that position. It would allow the current superintendent, Glenda Ritz, to remain on the board. Ritz testified before the House Committee in opposition to the measure, saying it would not resolve the disputes she has had with the State Board of Education. Voters view the election of the superintendent to really be a nonpartisan decision. Look at the voting statistics throughout history and you will find that people vote for the person that they feel can best serve Indiana students, actually regardless of the political party. The bill now goes to the House floor for a full vote. 
More college students who receive state financial aid are on track to graduate in four years. According to a report the Commission for Higher Education released Wednesday, students are enrolling in more credit hours each semester. This comes after lawmakers passed legislation last year requiring college students who receive money through the 21st Century Scholar Program and Frank O'Bannon Scholarship Fund to complete 15 credit hours per semester. Higher Education Commissioner Teresa Lubber says commuting, communicating that requirement to both students and universities made the difference. If you set those expectations in place and you tell students what they need to do and you tell universities this is what, how we're going to pay for what we, what we value in Indiana, people change their behaviors. The report only shows results for one year, but in that time 21st century scholars saw a 56% increase in students completing 30 hours per year. And Frank O'Bannon students improved their completion rate by 21%. Indiana, Indiana's union membership is up by about 50,000 members. According to the latest U.S. Labor Department report, the state saw an increase from 9.3% in 2013 to 10.7% 10 of the labor force last year. This comes two years after Indiana became a right-to-work state. The rate of union membership in the workforce last year rose in nearly half of the 24 right-to-work states. That rate remained highest in forced unionization states where unions can require mandatory dues. And a proposed $82 million stadium would house Indianapolis's professional soccer team, the Indy 11, and serve as a multi-spot venue. The stadium would seat between 18 and 20,000 fans. They currently play on IUPUI's campus. The stadium there seats about 12,000 fans and lacks concession stands and locker rooms. The team wants to pay for the new stadium by imposing a tax on ticket sales. The legislature would need to approve that proposal. And Joe, if the, if the approval goes through, that project could break ground by the end of this year. That really illustrates the uh, popularity of this sport in Indiana. It does. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. State lawmakers need to come up with as much as $90 million to pay for a scholarship program for low-income Hoosiers. What will it take to keep the program afloat? And what would happen to the students if it can't be sustained? And a blizzard dumps up to 20 inches of snow. We're not talking about this week's storm on the East Coast. In our History Through Headlines segment, we take you back to the winter that Hoosiers will never forget. These stories right here on Indiana News Desk. I'm Bill Moyers. I was coming up out of the subway the other day when a fellow stopped me and said, I don't like what's happening in the country, but there's nothing I can do about it. I told him I don't buy it. There's a lot you can do. First, get the facts, and then get involved with other people who are trying to change things. Start with Moyers and Company and take it from there. Could be the best hour you spend this week. Friday night at 11. 15? 15, you think? 20. 21,000? 600. 20. 18, 5. 24. It's at least 40. Look, yeah, look at 40, it. 4,500,000. 650. 20. 650. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way. I knew it. It's just a blanket. It's laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. A scholarship program that helps thousands of Hoosiers attend college each year needs a big boost in funding to meet growing demand. By some estimates, the 21st Century Scholars Program needs an influx of about $90 million to help those who are in financial need. Barbara Harrington reports. A few years ago, John Obergfell never thought he'd end up here studying at Indiana University. I'd probably be living at home with my parents still. His outlook changed when he learned about Indiana's 21st Century Scholars Program. Students sign up in junior high and can receive up to full tuition for college if they meet all of the requirements. Definitely the best thing that's ever happened to me, I guess, because I wouldn't be able to be coming to school here. I wouldn't be able to study what I want to study because the field I want to go into, like, it's not really known for its salary, so I wouldn't be able to pay off any student loans. The program is based primarily on financial need, something that's determined using the federal application for student aid. 
But students also have to meet several requirements. They have to graduate from high school with at least a 2.5 grade point average, complete several planning activities at each grade level, and finish at least 30 credit hours during each year of college. Thank you. Scottsburg Middle School counselor Jane Noggle helps students apply for the program in seventh or eighth grade. She says more than half of the school students are eligible based solely on their financial needs. We know that a lot of kids even before they enter middle school have a mindset whether they think they can handle college or not based on mostly their family experiences. But then to have the question of whether I can financially afford it um, is not an issue if you're 21st century scholar. But with the demand for the scholarship so high in Scottsburg alone, Noggle's always worried about how the state will continue funding the program. A lot of people would agree that it should be something that finance alone shouldn't keep a student from making that decision to go to college or not. That said, um, I, I always wondered how they were going to fund this and we it's so important that we worry that at some point in the future they are going to have to phase the program out. Legislators don't want to phase the program out, but they will have to figure out how to deal with a large increase in the number of students using the 21st Century Scholars Program to pay for college over the next two years. Typically, a class of students enrolled in the program ranges from 12,000 to 15,000 scholars, but the Indiana Commission for Higher Education anticipates that number could jump to 27,000 this year and next. The program typically on an annual basis costs around $120 million per year. Um, this increase at its peak will be about $174 million a year. That extra cost is the result of two factors that made a larger number of students eligible for the program. The legislature widened the eligibility pool for a brief period of time, allowing sixth graders to sign up for the scholarship. And the national recession caused more families to qualify for assistance. For a period of time, you had more students who were eligible for the program and also just more students and families that had um, greater financial need than they had in prior years. And so this is really something that's been on the horizon for a while that we knew was coming in terms of some really um, significantly larger class sizes than in prior years. Senate Appropriations Chair Luke Kenley says legislators are committed to funding the program but they don't know where the money to cover the cost will come from. One of the concerns that I have is, is that we have other scholarship programs available for other people. And of course, if we have to fulfill the entitlement, that means we'll be taking it away from the Freedom of Choice Awards or the Frank O'Bannon scholarships, which would go to other students. Legislators passed a bill a couple of years ago that holds students who graduate high school after 2016 to higher standards than previously required. The hope is that will limit the number of 21st century scholars, making the program more sustainable in the future. One of the problems that we were having was that people were getting the scholarship, but they weren't actually graduating or finishing college or uh, meeting the grade requirements. And so we've had to ramp that up a little bit and, and do a little more uh, supervision in terms of making sure that people fulfill, fulfill the terms of the agreement. As legislators consider how to fund the scholarship program, John Obergfell is thinking ahead to graduation. My dream job that I could have, I'd want to work on a wildlife preserve or something in Africa maybe. And it's a dream he says would never be realized without 21st century scholars. If you have more educated people, things will get better, but it's so expensive that like it shouldn't just be for the elite like 1% who can afford it, it should be for everyone. Legislators must figure out how to fund the scholarship program by April. That's their deadline for approving the state budget. And now we take a look back at what was making the news in our History Through Headlines segment. It was January 1978. Harvey Milk was elected as the first openly gay person to public office in California. The Dallas Cowboys beat the Denver Broncos in Super Bowl XII. The Bee Gees Saturday Night Fever started its 24-week domination of the top albums list, and Indiana was pummeled by the most devastating blizzard in the state's history. The headline reads, State in Emergency, City is Shut Down. 
The blizzard began Wednesday, January 25, 1978. For the next three days, temperatures fell to zero degrees and winds gusted up to near 50 miles per hour. 78 is certainly the, the storm that all winter storms uh, subsequent to that have been compared to. Indianapolis was placed in a state of emergency. People were told to stay home as the city shut down. The massive snowdrifts made for difficult travel. The uh, governor uh, sent uh, tanks out from the National Guard onto I-65 to remove stranded semis. The snow and ice spread across much of the Midwest. Cars were stranded on highways and in driveways. Neighbors helped each other dig themselves free of the snowdrifts. Once the snow melted that spring, many areas suffered massive flooding. Actually, Alex, <laughs> forecasters are predicting significant snowfall late Saturday night through Sunday night. A winter storm watch takes effect Saturday evening, but it's for the northern two-thirds of central <laughs> Indiana, where snowfall amounts in excess of about six inches are possible. The areas include Terre Haute, Spencer, Martinsville, and uh, Greenwood North. Okay, but could those patterns change, possibly? Correct. It's still kind of early, <laughs> so we're going to have to kind of keep an eye on that in uh, these next few days. And, of course, uh, Keep an eye on WTIUnews.org. Yeah, absolutely. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. Main Source Bank headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Mainsource, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high-speed fiber gigabit internet. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. And by WTIU members, thank you.